So the moose are not, for those that were here last year, we, uh, they're not on wheels. Uh, we also didn't clear the stage because I forgot about this set. So uh, we're going to have a kind of staid looking thing, but it's not going to be boring. Uh, the idea with Between Two Moose, so for those that have been coming to ShmooCon for a while, you know the closing plenary has been kind of something different that we do. Um, for a while, um, we, we just kind of pick people from the CFP process who were um, submitted similar things, like if four or five people did something in social engineering, they all look kind of decent, we're like, hey, we're not going to accept you as an individual talk, but we're going to glue you all together and make you give like a group talk at the end. Which for some presenters, they're like, that's super cool and exciting. For other people, it's like terrifying, right? Because like they have the way that they want to present. And I say, no, you don't have an hour, you have 10 minutes, and there's going to be five other people on stage with you. So that was a fun experiment. Um, and so after a few years of that, we were thinking of trying to do something different. And, and what we ended up falling upon was obviously this is kind of a play on between two ferns, except not nearly with the production quality, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is hard to be below the production quality of be between two ferns. Uh, but also to focus on people in the industry that have shaped and influenced it as people, as individuals, and not as, you know, not up here to talk tech and, and policy and that kind of thing. And if we trend into that, that's totally cool. But um, this is our second year doing this. So um, last year was an unmitigated disaster. Um, uh, Whitney, did you have fun last year? Yeah. You did. She's still recovering. <laughs> what? I'm going to keep on cruising. So um, anyway, so this year uh, we've got three guests between uh, two ferns, uh, or excuse me, moose, <laughs> shit. That's a copyright violation right there. I think I owe somebody money. Uh, um, uh, do I have a thing? Do you have a, uh, there's a dongle right there. Are you, are you going to be up here with us? No, I'm just, I'm helping you out. She's helping me out. Look at the help I'm receiving right now. So anyway. Um, now I do this? Hey, I'm definitely sleeping on the couch. Can yeah. you help me? Um, yeah, I'd love to help you. I'm not doing anything. So. I'm married. Do you, do you want me to, do you need a soda or something? Yeah. I can go get it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. One ice, cube. one ice cube. She's kind of a, never mind. Um, so these are our two moose. Um, and amusingly, last year we already had one of them before the con started because like we already possessed a half size moose because that's what you do. Uh, when you run ShmooCon, and so we bought the other one. So this is the original moose, this is Star, and that one's named? Gate. Gate. Right, so we have Star and Gate, the moose. Uh, yeah, where is the Stargate? Yeah, let's awkwardly assemble the Stargate on stage while we're doing this. this let's make this as awkward as possible. So, so the first guest I'd like to bring out uh, uh, is uh, Kirsten Tott. Kirsten, why don't you come on up and join us. Um, Kirsten will give her own introduction, actually. Oh, thank you. Yes, that was actually, it doesn't need to be up there. Oh, for the audience? Yeah. We'll make it work. You can sit on the moose. I was actually hopeful that, well, here, you can have this microphone. Why don't you introduce yourself, um, I, you know, whatever you feel like. In song would be great, but I'm not sure that you sing. Do you sing? I, I sing to those in a closed environment. In a closed environment? Is a karaoke bar a closed environment? No, I don't do karaoke you don't, bar. Okay, so you're really closed it's environment. Not, yeah. Okay, all right. Not that. So, but I could do that. I'll dance. I well, can, dance. can you dance while you do your intro? I, well, I could, but I don't think I'm going to. It depends upon how good this Shouldn't conversation goes. Shouldn't you dance and do? It depends yeah. upon how good I'll, this conversation I'll dance. goes. Well, it's, it's a polka. Like it. can, somebody, can you play a polka? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there we go. Five words. I just step. No, so you have to do it with me. Yeah. But then I can't talk at the same time. Because who, who are you? <laughs> we need to know. We could do that. This is like not quite the Pennsylvania polka, but we're close. <laughs> is this like the Philadelphia polka? It is. I think it's actually Hava Nagila, isn't it? Oh, no? Oh, yeah. No, I was really wrong. <laughs> Tetris. Tetris, holy. Te <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Spam, if you're here, I'm really sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was terrible. Anyway, why don't you tell us about yourself? Um, so I'm a recovering bureaucrat, um, started uh, in the White House Drug Policy Office. Um, everyone used to love the phrase, yeah, I did drugs in the White House for three years. It's not really that funny, but for the people that like really never did it, it was always something that got a laugh with the lawyers particularly. <laughs> um, and then I uh, worked in the White House Domestic Policy Office doing urban development. Always thought I was going to work in cities to help with environmental issues, urban issues, things like drugs. Um, and then. Went up to the Hill, uh, and I'm from Connecticut, so I cold called Senator Lieberman's office, which is a trail, kind of a theme. I do a lot of cold calling in my career when 
there's something that I think I wanted to do, um, even though I may not be totally qualified to do it. And they said, yeah, you know, call back in about eight months, probably thinking that that would dismiss me. But I did call back in eight months. And they said, well, if you can come, because I was on a, a fellowship, if you're going to work for free, then you can come in and be his economic policy advisor for a little bit. All of that should scare you, because when, you know, you've got 20-somethings just being pulled up for free to do major policy, not like anything like that's happening right now, but just, no, you know, no. looking at, at where things go. And then um, I was working for him in the summer of uh, 2001, which I don't know how many, um, I usually don't ever put myself in these age categories, but in the summer of 2001, Senator Jeffords from Vermont, who was a Republican, decided to become an independent. And what that did is it flipped the entire Senate from a majority of Republicans to Democrats. And so all of the chairs of the committee became ranking members and vice versa, which you know is a fascinating kind of a survival of the fittest. And so what that meant was Senator Lieberman, who had been ranking member of the Governmental Affairs Committee, became chair of the Governmental Affairs Committee. The, the GAC, as it was called, which is pretty appropriate because it was one of the most boring committees out there, post office namings, although it did, uh, it did post do... Post office namings? Yes. That goes to Congress? That goes to Congress. Excellent. Yes. That seems like a valuable use of time. But yeah. right along those lines, and this is not a political statement, we did do the nomination of John Bolton in that same year, which was a fascinating back and forth. Um, but what that meant was Senator Lieberman got a whole bunch of uh, new staff. He got more money to bring people over to the committee. And so he asked if I would go over to the committee staff, which I really wasn't crazy about doing. And I had just gotten a job to work in urban development in Bethesda, Maryland, which is an interesting kind of misnomer in some ways. But um, I, I made the decision to stay uh, because I just felt like I hadn't had enough experience there and really hadn't understood it. My first assignment for him was a hearing on critical infrastructure protection, uh, which was scheduled for September 12, 2001. 9-11 uh, happened on that Tuesday. We got on the phone that night. Everything shut down, for those of you who remember. And he said, I still want to go through with the hearing. And we were the only hearing on the Hill that day. Um, our witnesses were different because for those of you, I don't know if you know Mudge, um, he was up in Boston. He was supposed to come down. We were bringing in cybersecurity, physical infrastructure, before people were really talking about it. But we had two witnesses. And that day, Senator Lieberman turned to two of us who were staffing him on the hearing and said, there should be a Department of Homeland Security in response to what happened in 9-11. Um, and so <laughs> what that meant was it was sort of this futile task for about nine months to create a legislation for a new agency, which we really thought, there were three of us working on it, would never really go anywhere. Um, our committee was also working on the Enron investigation, which was a lot more important at the time. But then I woke up one morning in June, and there on the front page of the paper was President Bush's counterproposal for DHS. So I ended up working on the legislation to create DHS, which is how I got involved in cybersecurity. I wrote the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection, Bioterror, and R&D directorates for DHS at the time. Um, as my uh, business partner husband likes to say, when you go through TSA and you have to take off your shoes, you can swear at me, but it's really not my fault. Um, but it was looking at that infrastructure. And so, you know, fast forward, I worked in uh, California for a while on Homeland Security Infrastructure Protection for uh, San Francisco and for the state and then uh, worked for a consulting firm, a nonprofit, and started my own uh, company in uh, 2011, which is when I had the great honor of meeting Mr. Potter. I think my greatest claim to fame is I've actually seen him in a sport coat. Yep. It even fit. <laughs> it's a little victory in life. I think I may have even seen it more than once. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good. Yeah, right. Yeah, Probably. It was, yeah, it was a polo. <laughs> no ties, for hell no. So, like, my tip... What? No. Sunglasses. Uh, always yeah. with the sunglasses. Like, always with the sunglasses. But they change. They do. And you notice that, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, so, uh, the one, my one takeaway from Kirsten from that intro is, like, she's kind of a badass. Um, and has had... A, all yeah, all the way a badass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most definitely a badass. Um, and, and everything that you just described that you've done in the last 20 years was not, like, what you intended to do with your career, question mark? So, <laughs> it's like, so I mean, and, and the landscape of things that you had to get smart on was immense. Like, how did you deal with that, like, fire hose of, like, you have to learn critical infrastructure, you have to learn cybersecurity, you have to learn all these things to be effective? Well, I think it's the thing that we all do, um, or at least what I've always done is you find the people who are better at it than you, which, <laughs> when you know nothing, that's pretty easy. Um, but starting with that summer, when, I mean, I, I said this, and it rolls off everyone's tongue, sort of, when you say critical infrastructure protection. But when he said that to me, I was like, I don't understand what those words are. I mean, I understood infrastructure and all that. There was a presidential decision directive 
Uh, I had a person who maybe some of you know, um, Paul Nicholas, who worked in DHS, went to Microsoft, is now at Google, who had helped write it. He sat down with me and walked me through what this directive was. Um, and it's talking to people, experts. I mean, this is my, my greatest resource for all things that don't involve policy. Oh, and <laughs> policy. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> but the technical <laughs> side. Um, I, and I think it's always, it's finding the people that know more than you do and talking to them. And it's also looking at where you want to see things go. And I mean, that's the cold calling aspect of things. It's like if you see something that is interesting to you or you, you want to direct it, it's, it's going to those people and finding out how they got there. Yeah. So, um, Do I get to sit on the moose? Yeah, you can be my guest. I brought it over, and, um, and then you just were riffing, and it was great. And I didn't well, want to I was interrupt dancing you. So, too. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah. Is more comfortable. The dance was awkward. I, I don't, that's the most I've danced. <laughs> and, yeah. I'll dance like, with Heidi. Yeah. yeah she said you don't dance with I don't, her. I do not dance with her or anyone. It's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm, I'm grooming my moose. The, um, the one thing that, that struck me about even that, when I say, hey, can you do an introduction? Like, you had a point, you wove a story, whatever. You're always really put together. Um, and what, what, when we traveled around and would do work and we're flying around the country together, um, like, I would land at some airport and I am grumpy and angry and I look like I just, like, graduated college, my hair's all jacked up or whatever. Um, and I'd have to, like, go to the hotel and change really quick and get ready for a meeting. we get to the meeting and I'm just like, ugh. And Kirsten would always walk in and be like, hey, and, like, totally put together and everything was ready. Like, it was... I mean, it makes me sound annoying. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe hey. a little. So, uh, but like, so I, I want to know, chocolate. like, what are Kirsten's travel tips? Like, as your road warrior, <laughs> what are the things that you do to stay sane, to like be able, like, how do you keep your clothes from not looking like they, you balled them up and, and put them in with a wild weasel? Like, that's my, like, I, 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 I'll fold this shirt as nicely as possible and I pull it out and I'm like, what the hell happened? That's the key. Like, you, yeah, it must have been the TSA. Shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so unwrinkable clothes. Unwrink unwrinkable, I mean, yeah. not, not wrinkle resistant, but so like cast iron. Exactly, yeah, okay. clothes that don't wrinkle. <laughs> and I mean, so, I mean, you really want to get, I mean, I'm not sure how much of an application is to many of you, but there are some of you for whom this is definitely applicable. I mean, there are these dresses that don't wrinkle and they're really comfortable and I wear a pair of boots and I drink a lot of water and I have a lot of dark chocolate. And I noticed that you gave chocolate in the speaker's bag, which felt like she did. Of course you did, because yeah. you're so on top of it. It was actually Lots from our personal chocolate. stash, because Heidi and I are keto right now, and so we just had to get rid of all our chocolate. So we actually, the speakers just got <laughs> Whatever's the, in the drawer. part of the strategic supply of Potter chocolate, actually, was I'll what take it was. It. I'll, I'll take it anyway. So dark chocolate. Like dark a, chocolate. It makes travel. me happy. I mean, and you know, there are people who think that it has magic in it. I'm, I'm a believer. So like when you're sort of frustrated, and it's like that indulgent treat that like makes it all OK. Yeah, yeah. And water. I always have to be drinking something. Okay. No, I, I have noticed that. And it was usually it was not bourbon. So that was, um, yeah. It depends on what time, time of the day, day. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. how the meeting's going. For sure. Hello. For sure. Commission. So, so, yeah, <laughs> That's right. Cybersecurity. So, um, Boston or DC? Boston. Or DC? Boston. But, like where to live? Yeah, just in general. Like just a concept. Mm. Like Boston or DC. So I grew up in New England. Right. And my grandfather was a Red Sox fan. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to have like the whole history. And so now my son's a Red Sox fan. So there's the New England connection. But there's a parochialism sometimes to Boston when you're like, come on, think outside of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and DC, I mean, I'm not giving you an answer because this is actually a really interesting question. Um, it's, I, it was, it's, it was poorly know. framed. That's what made it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you get very little guidance. You're like, I don't know what to say. This is insane. Um, sports teams, I have to go Boston. Really? Sorry. We have uh, like world champs here. I know, I know. Like in several sports. And then the, there's a football team that should be sold. It should so. be sold. <laughs> But, so, I'm an Alex Smith fan because, and I think he got screwed by the 49ers, and then I was really sad to see him, you know, get, leave the Chiefs to come to Redskins, and then he comes to the Redskins, and he has almost a life, like, alter, well, he ha has a life-altering uh, injury, but it's like the curse of the Redskins. Yeah. I mean, stop bringing people here and hurting them. Yeah. Because no. then they go off and they go do other good things that are pretty All good. All the Redskins do is hurt people. <laughs> they hurt people. They're fans, they're and players. Alex Smith, I was like, come on, not him, too. Like, yeah, I like that. Him. See, and um, I'm a big fan of all Washington sports teams except for the Skins. I, I do can. like them, though. I mean, yeah. I think you know. I have a, a son who's a huge sports fan. Um, he's got uh, Miles Cerebral Palsy Sports or How He Talks, and it's his greatest language. And so he does have New England allegiances, but we are all about hometown sports teams. Right. So Nats, Caps, it is tough to get behind the Redskins. It is. I mean, it really it's is. It's just hard. But yeah. Wizards, I mean, it's, it's all good. Oh, right. We have a basketball team. We do. Yeah. And, and oh, by the way, there's a WNBA team that actually they're, won the national yeah, really championship. Good. And you know, like... I don't see them getting a parade anytime. They keep on talking about it, but I don't think we've, sat, we've had it they, yet. They should get a parade before anything good happens for they the Redskins. So. All right. Yeah. With, with that, 
We're going to add one more player to the mix. So, um, I have to get off the moose. No, you can stay on the moose. I'm going to give Matt my moose if he wants, or okay. he can sit in a chair. He could stand awkwardly, whatever. So, Matt Blaze, are you still around or did he flee? <laughs> All right, Matt Blaze, everybody. Woo! All right, Matt is going to do an introduction of himself okay. while sitting on the moose. Okay. Um, I hope this can support. How much weight can this support? We were talking about it earlier, and I. Well, let's find out. Let's yeah. find out. Yeah, yeah I'm, okay. I'm totally yeah. game. I like Matt's uh, experimental mindset. Yeah. Uh, introduce okay. yourself, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, hi, I'm uh, Matt Blaze. Um, so I, I've been around at Shmukan and places for a while. Um, I, you know, you mentioned. Um, doing things that you're not qualified for is the best uh, way to uh, path through life, and I am doing the extreme version of this. So I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I recently moved from you know, a place with computer scientists uh, at University of Pennsylvania in the computer science department, which is kind of the place a, kind of place a person like me would, would end up, uh, down to Georgetown University, um, which is here, and uh, half of me is a law professor, um, and I'm not actually a lawyer, um, so I'm just making law stuff up as, as I go. Uh, and, you know, it, it turns out there's like really nothing they can do about it. And, uh, you know, law students pretty much believe uh, what you tell them, so, um, you know, no one may even notice. Uh, so, the, uh, you know, the reason that uh, I'm doing this is that. You know, I found out like over the last uh, you know a couple of decades, my work has been uh, kind of right at the intersection of technology and computing issues uh, and public policy stuff. Uh, so I started out doing cryptography, and then all of a sudden the Clipper chip came out, and uh, then I, you know, uh, you know, started working on surveillance uh, and surveillance technology. Um, for a while, which has all sorts of both technical and legal uh, implications, and the uh, uh, you know at some point somebody decided that that meant that I must know a lot about voting systems, um, which, which was completely false. Uh, but they asked me to lead a team evaluating some voting systems, and uh, you know I, I did that. Uh, 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 a couple of times, and now people think I know about voting. And so I've been uh, talking uh, uh, to... Uh, there are I've also been... people who think you don't know anything about voting. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. In, in all fairness, those people think I understand it and I'm being malicious. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. so the... Uh, but, you know, I assure you, my, my damage is accidental, not on purpose, mm. but it's, uh, you know, there are people who think that my damage is on purpose. Um, the... Uh, the, uh, so I've, I've been spending the last uh, couple of years kind of working, you know, all voting systems all the time. And, uh, you know, there's an election coming up, and, you know, my main goal is to make sure it's not the last one. Yay! So, yeah. um, that's, a, that's a cheery thought. Yeah. Between that and viral outbreaks, we're, yeah. you know, 50-50 chance for Shmukon next yeah. year. I have so. one of those, too. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, don't touch, touch Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. As a general rule, don't touch Matt. Yeah. But in this specific case, definitely don't touch Matt. He is sick. Not with coronavirus, yeah. we think. Yeah. So, um, so I followed your uh, migration from the greater New York, New Jersey area to D.C. and your love for this city. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your feelings about living and working in D.C.? So, um, you know, so it's a lot easier to move down to D.C. Uh, if you do it via Philadelphia. Oh, um, right. So, Which is so, not New Jersey or New York. Yeah, yeah. right. So, Got I, you know, I, mean, I grew up in New York City, and I spent, um, you know, a, a, about uh, 14 or 15 years at Penn, which is in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is a great city, uh, which is something that it took me about 14 years to figure out, because uh, uh, it, it basically invites comparison with New York in ways that New York always wins, uh, and so it, it took me a while to start understanding it on its own terms. D.C., on the other hand, um, doesn't really, you know, it's its own thing. So, uh, you know, it, it is not like any other place. And, you know, it's got nice neighborhoods, and, you know, there, it, it's, it's an interesting place. It's also a company town uh, in uh, 
ways that would drive me absolutely nuts if I were working for that particular company. But uh, you know, as, as an outsider, you can just kind of be amused by walking into your local Safeway and the conversation with the cashier, uh, with the person in front of you is, yeah, I can't believe so-and-so uh, flipped on that bill. You know, there's just no getting away from it. But uh. So um, one of the other things, so I do follow you on Twitter. Like, again, this is how I know Matt's life, because he actually wears a lot of it on his sleeve, including your conversations with random Twitter people, which I find fascinating <laughs> as a spectator sport. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please don't do it. So uh, I guess my, my question is, what is your philosophy about Twitter? Like, how do you think about this when random person says, Matt, I think you're wrong, or maybe you should try being an expert, or whatever random thing they say. How do, what, what's in your head? I, I mean, you know, I mean, Twitter's, Twitter is both awful and great, right? I mean, and what it's great for is, um, you know, it, it's a great place to really rapidly disseminate stuff. And, you know, uh, you know I try to use it that way. Uh, it's also a, you know, a great, by which I mean terrible, way to engage with uh, people who are, uh, you know, interested in things. And, you know, it, there's a lot of that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you don't back down from it, which is great. Um, you actually remind me, I worked at a company where uh, the CEO uh, was very uh, outgoing. Uh, it was a very, it, he was worth a lot of money, he was very outgoing, and he would not think twice a, uh, about picking a street fight with a random person on Twitter and basically saying, like, come and get me. And, like, it, we're like, we need force protection. Like, this guy's just going to, like, roll down the road and get in a fight with a drunk from a bar who he just posted on Twitter about. Um, and you're not quite at that level, but I definitely, there, there's a bit of Matt, like, is like, Matt is Matt, and he's like, just, this is it, man. If you do disagree, like, well, you don't actually say F you, but I can hear it. It sounds like it's in your head. It's in my head. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so there is a topic that um, uh, I think everyone is concerned about and, and, and has, you know, has been kind of front of mind in conversation lately. Uh, and I want you to talk a little bit about cork and towel. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So this uh, has its origins. This is uh, the, probably the stupidest possible game. And I, you know, as, as one of its inventors, I'm also terrible at it. But the, uh, this has its roots in uh, DEF CON four or five years ago. A bunch of us uh, ended up, oops, wow, that's oops, great. Oops, uops. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, wow, you have a, a whole page for this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we yeah. got serious. Yeah. You, you, uh, buckle up. Uh, yeah. So this, yeah. oh, wow, this is awesome. Uh, so this has its roots in um, uh, a, uh, DEF CON, I think it was, or some you know, large hacker gathering in Las Vegas uh, four or five years ago, uh, a group of us ended up in um, uh, Bruce and Heidi's suite, uh, which was this very nice uh, place. But they had completely run out of food or drink, but there were plenty of empty wine bottles uh, around. And someone had spilled something, so there was a big uh, case of... Uh, 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 paper towels. And, uh, you know, a group of us were thinking, well, you know, we're hackers, we should be able to make fun out of anything, so let's invent the game of cork and towel, because uh, we just had some corks and some paper towel rolls. We're like the 1800s kid with yeah. the hoop in a stick. Yeah. We're like, right. yay! And, uh, so, so much fun! Uh, you know, so this is sort of Mornington Crescent. Um, you know, the rules are a little bit more fluid than deserve to pee on a uh, on, on, on the internet. But uh, <laughs> oh, uh, we, yeah. we created, we violated the rules of Cork and Towel yeah, by posting the rules. Yeah. Well, you, you post the basic rules. Oh, you, you okay. can only post the advanced rules. Well, yeah, uh, and there's house it. rules for yeah. like you know when you're in a house. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the the basic idea is that it is a it is a game of skill in which you take a roll of paper towels and a cork from a Chateau de Pep uh, uh, wine. Would you like some wine, by the way? Uh, I would love some, but I'm not going to have some. Would um, you like some water? Uh, I would love some. OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, uh, so you take the I'm cork the only guy of, drinking wine up here. A, uh, of a Chateau de Pep uh, and drop it into the core of the paper towel roll. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, It sounds boring. It but really sounds boring. With the wine. Now, it starts to make sense. Oh, it turns sense. out we, we, there was no wine. Oh, that's actually. right. Yeah, yeah. This was sober people who invented <laughs> this. Uh, we were just really, really bored. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> At DEF CON. Yeah. Like, right? Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that's pretty much the game. And it turns out you can, you know, you can 
you can make this hard and interesting and pretend that it's a game of skill. And uh, yeah, there you go. So uh, if the court goes into the tube, you get a point. And if it doesn't, you get no points. That's the scoring, right? Super complicated. This is uh, not a competition cork. This is just a cork we got. Uh, yeah. I sell competition corks. We brand them. Uh -huh. uh, and so, oh, you did, you did wow. bring a, what? <gasps> I asked them to bring their own lucky cork. Wait, Matt, like the a, founder of the game, didn't bring wait, it. That looks like a synthetic cork. Um, uh, metal bats and baseball and synthetic corks and cork and towel. Yeah. Like, it's, these things just don't go together. Yeah. So what, what, wine is, what wine is that? This is Italian, Uccidago. Okay, it is an Italian lucky, lucky cork. All right, Kirsten's going to try her first hand at her first cork and towel. Well, I actually did one already. Oh, you did? Okay, her second. It's kind of like a mulligan. Yeah, okay, this is a mulligan, yeah. Oh! Uh, so, there, that's really, this is great. Like this. So, one time, I managed to throw it across the room like a football through the tube, and I won the whole night. That was it. Try again? I'm not going to try again. You cannot repeat perfection. Like, like, so Matt should, uh, let's, see, let's see the master. I mean, this is really like, this is your game, sir. So, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, you need yeah, a cork, because yeah. you didn't bring a cork. Yeah, I didn't bring a cork. Yeah, this is, this is synthetic. I, uh, yeah, this is, this <laughs> Man, is, he's yeah. just dissing me. Uh, uh, oh, this is about the success rate, too, because it turns out it's really hard at first. It is, it is actually remarkably more difficult. This is actually what makes the game kind of enjoyable, is that um, it's actually hard to do. So we're going to take turns dropping cork through this hole while we bring up Beetle who is going to be our last uh, guest person. Beetle, join us on stage. You, you have to, like, it, it does smell like wine because it, it, it was wine. Um, it, it bounces a couple times, you get, like, half a point? No, there's no half points. Always whole integers only. So we kept it simple because we didn't want to make it complicated. It's like one of those carnival games. Yes, like it's yeah. unwinnable, right? Like, there, at Mythbusters <laughs> later, there's going to be a special cork and towel Mythbusters. We're like, you can't win. Oh, damn it. You know, I think actually, that, is that Bounty? Uh, I, I, no, it's like a knockoff paper towel, okay. whatever we could buy. Well, it's Viva. Viva. Yeah. Okay, then, you know. Oh, that's the a, problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we have a synthetic cork. I am totally screwed up our cork and towel implementation. Competition with, cork. With, and, uh, apologies to anybody that works at Viva for calling you a second-rate paper towel, but it's true. So... <laughs> Jeez. Anyway, so this is Beetle. Um, hey! So Beetle's actually the reason that you're here. So he was the guy who came up with the idea for the con um, in kind of a drunken stupor in Vegas. And we can say back in the day now. We can say way back in the day, yeah. We were getting old, as it turns out. So why don't, you, uh, why don't you give us an introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm a senior principal at Amazon Web Services Are those now. words redundant? Yeah. Okay. Probably. Senior <laughs> principal. All right. Yeah. There's one. There's one probably level higher than that. Okay. I imagine. I'm uh, not. I'm not. A major senior to that. principal. Probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I work on the AWS security team. Uh, I helped start that team almost a decade ago, and uh, most of the time, I'm working on these days uh, proactive engagement with independent and academic security researchers. Uh, a little bit of extra action is applied towards figuring out uh, how we will do that in a way that's very um, customer friendly. So I authored our vulnerability uh -huh. disclosure policy uh, at AWS. And in addition to that, uh, I've looked to iterate from there to make it easier for customers to do uh, or engage um, others to do uh, security testing for their environments in AWS. Uh, before that, I was uh, a geek for uh, the U.S. government and military at the MITRE Corporation. Oh, oh, Kirsten dropped the cork. Where we devised new and improved methods to put cork through paper towels. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and then right before that, uh, I was uh, a guy that was rappelling out of helicopters and every once in a while helping officers reset their passwords, which got me into security. <laughs> Watch him do it the first. You didn't even hit the roll of paper towels, man. <laughs> that, do it again. It wasn't even trying. Don't, you can't half-ass it. Oh, uh, uh, that was actually pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, you grew up uh, in the South. Yes. Yeah. I believe we're below the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and then you got stationed in the North. The very North. The very North. Yeah, so the, the majority of my military career, short as it was, was uh, located in Anchorage, Alaska at Fort Richardson. So... Um, which is oh! <laughs> Woohoo! Rattled one in. Can somebody keep score? Uh, Just so you know, the score is one to nothing. 
All right. So you, I, by, ironic, the rules, by the way, by the rules of cork and towel, we now take away the cork and the towel and never speak of this again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? No. These are our house rules. That's your house rules. There you go. So um, one of the things, so um, I, when I met you, like we had a bit of a bond because I've been in Alaska for a while. That's where, hey, oh, what? <laughs> Get out. It's, it's a game of horse now. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, spin around. Well, that's, you got to increase the difficulty, <laughs> drop it behind your head. And Matt's a little yeah. nervous. I'll see if he can do this. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It is an on your honor system, and if he thinks that's honorable, it's okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so you get one more shot. Absolutely. All right, so you told me a story once about uh, driving a Humvee uh, north of Fort Richardson and your attempts to get it stuck. Yeah. Um, can you give me like the, 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 con the condensed version of attempting to get a Humvee stuck in Alaska? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you're, when you're in the Army and you're not actually at war, <laughs> Uh, which was, you know, uh, during that time, it was a relatively peaceful time in our nation's history. So, um, and the things that you do in, uh, in Alaska, you know, uh, I guess, you know, expecting the Russians to invade and preparing for that with a lot of cold weather. They uh, actually come over on kayaks sometimes. <laughs> uh, when Heidi grew up in Southeast, like, uh, these Russians came over on sea kayaks, and it just, like, you know, she was out in the Aleutians. It wasn't like she was in Juneau. For those that don't know Alaskan geography, it's a big state. Um, that was a terrible joke. But anyway, the Aleutians <laughs> basically like poke Russia, and so these people just were kayaking along the Aleutians. So the Russians were like, hey, what's up? And they fed them, and, and then they went on their way. But anyway. So when we were digging foxholes in the tundra, which yeah. is actually not a very easy thing to do, yeah, I would believe, <laughs> uh, we had to come up with uh, interesting ways to not only amuse ourselves, but impress generals. And there was a general that wanted to see uh, the operations of extracting a vehicle from, you know, uh, just basically tow, tow vehicle operations. and Because uh, that is impressive when you're a one star. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. tow some shit. OK, like, yes, sir, we will tow some shit. And so the idea was, let's go get a Humvee stuck, and then we'll tow it out of it being stuck. And there's a mixture of, uh, you know, there was a mixture of snow and mud in an area that we drove a lot of Humvees to. And I was with an officer, and he ordered me to get the Humvee stuck. And we spent the better part of an afternoon trying to figure out how to get a Humvee stuck. And it turns out it's not easy. So you just spend the afternoon driving around trying to jump off of things and roll into things. And, and eventually somebody did get stuck. Uh, they, they jumped off of like about a six foot sort of cliff and then splatted into a mud bog. And they were up to their basically doors in mud. So at that point, we got to demonstrate something that was super military. At that point. <laughs> <laughs> Our strategic towing capability yeah. is very but important. It, but it was, you know, I, I got ordered to get a Humvee stuck. stuck. Yeah, I, no, that's like one of my favorite, <laughs> like, army uh, orders. Yeah. Uh, I, I was never serving. Which, so, uh, I mean, we like those tow vehicle operations better than, or, or not maybe as much as, you know, going and fetching race cars from Florida. So, or yeah, so that's the other thing. So he and I have a long history that involved, like, motorsports and things of that nature. Uh, so he uh, raced a car. It was the only car of its class. Uh, in the country, um, because every other car in his class is faster than it. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was an 88 Mustang that Ford built a car with four cylinders and eight spark plugs because they couldn't quite figure out how to ignite all the gas. Uh, Mid-80s auto engineering was a complicated thing. So we drove our ass all the way down to, to uh, uh, Daytona to pick up this car and drove it all the way back. And Beatles never raced a car before. And he goes out and he starts racing out at some point West Virginia. Now, to be clear, like as a kid, I worked in a lumber yard and I worked on heavy equipment. But I never really worked on cars. And so I didn't know what I was doing, and I crewed for him. Um, and so I remember the first time that, like, I don't know if you, I want to know, did you ever think about the fact that I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and you were like, hey, can you bleed the brakes? I'm like, <laughs> sure, I'll figure that out. And then he leaves. I'm like, boy, if I screw that up, he probably is going to die. Like, <laughs> you put well, a lot of faith in us, man. Well, you know, you, you kept me alive during drunk DEF cons, so I figured that, that, that was good. <laughs> That's the bar? <laughs> that, like, there you go. That, that, so if you ever need brain surgery, by definition, I can also do that. Like, sure. there's, Absolutely. That transitivity of trust doesn't go through domains of that nature. Nope. Like, nope. Oh, my God. So didn't, you never were like question, like, I wonder if I'm going to die because these people don't know how to fix my car? No, not, I mean, at the time, I was just, I was just so happy to be on a, you know, on a racetrack with 55 other cars, yeah. uh, even if I was, like, the slowest one. But. Yeah. <laughs> so I think my, my least favorite Beatle memory uh, is actually from the racetrack one day when uh, he radios in, and we had radios, and they were terrible, but they almost worked. Um, and, and we were wireless guys. We were wireless guys, yeah. We were like, we can't make this shit work. So, <laughs> so he radios in, like, car's not really uh, uh, putting power to the ground. I don't know what's going on. 
and you know, we were like radioing like, well, bring it in. And this sounds glamorous as if you're going to bring it into a pit stall in the garage. No, it's West Virginia. You bring it in and they drive through a field. And so here comes the Mustang, <laughs> limping along, and it's in the middle of the field. And it's a doubleheader weekend, and it's hotter than hell. And we're like, what happened? Like, oh, I've shifted. It just feels like, you know, the transmission's not hooking up right or whatever. We're like, okie dokie. And, and so uh, maybe the synchros blew up something. So in the middle of the field in West Virginia, we drop a transmission out of a Mustang race car, which is not a trivial thing to do, right? Because transmissions are basically solid chunks of steel, um, and they're heavy, and we got a drop down, and we looked, and the transmission was fine, and we're like, what actually happened? And he's like, well, I may have downshifted instead of into fourth, into second, <laughs> and, and over rev the engine. And we're like, oh, I bet you the valve train is in pieces. So we sure put, pick up the valve cover, and the valve train's like, hello, and like springs are everywhere, whatever. <laughs> But let me tell you the amount of effort it takes to open up a valve cover. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, <laughs> bolts. Take out the valve cover. Look, the valves are fucked up. Could have checked that first. Yeah, yeah. Instead, like, oh, let's take half the car out underneath it. Incompetent in the, crew. <laughs> and, and so there was, a, there, was a, there was, a, I think, a stern warning from the crew chief that you tell us exactly what happened next time. If you ever don't tell us exactly what happened, we're going to get leave and leave you with a transmission in the middle of the field. It's just going to be like <laughs> your problem. So um, it was endearing in hindsight. What did you do with the car that we brought back from New York? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so I will give you the abridged story of my car mistake. Um, as a child, uh, uh, I was really into cars, and um, uh, my, actually my dad crewed for a team uh, up at Watkins Glen in New York for a while, and I would go to, woohoo! Well, who is that? Yeah. You don't want to identify yourself now as a Watkins Glen? Like, yes. Yeah. Jeez. Anyway, so um, I, loved, I loved cars. What? Who's that guy? Who's that, that guy? That guy. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, random citizen. So anyway, uh, um, I, I, I fell in love with cars. I loved everything about cars. And uh, I worked at my family's lumber company, which is like a half mile from my house. And uh, there's a guy whose house is right next to the lumber company, was a Volvo collector. Um, is anyone familiar with Volvo collecting? I it am is now. just buy as many rusty Volvos as possible, let them sit there, and maybe one day they'll like reproduce and they'll be a viable <laughs> Volvo. Because none of them are viable on their own. And so he gets a Volvo 1800, uh, which is this curvy car. It's what Roger Moore drove in The Saint, the TV series The Saint. Um, and it looks, I mean, it's a beautiful car. It doesn't look like a boxy, you know, 240DL or whatever. I mean, it's a really nice looking car. Um, and it's got this hood scoop on it and whatever. And so he gets it and he parks it in his front yard and then he puts a for sale sign on it, which is weird because he didn't sell any of his cars. And so I was 15, I was about to turn 16. and. I'm like, that's an awesome car. So all summer long, I save up working at the lumber company. Now, to be clear, I worked there completely illegally, so I got paid out of the vending machine. So he wanted 1500 bucks for that car, and I had to get 1500 bucks in quarters out of the vending machine. So I was encouraging every employee, like, drink all the Mountain Dew. Like, just go, go, go. I need a car. Like, go drink it. So I save up, and I finally get enough money. And it's the day before my birthday, and I'm having dinner with my folks, and I proudly say, Mom, Dad, tomorrow, I'm going down the road, and I'm going to buy that 1800 off of Louie. And it's the only time I ever heard my dad swear, and he says, you're not going to go buy that piece of shit. And I'm like, eh, okay, and you didn't cross my dad. Like, that was not going to be a thing. So I'm like, God damn it, I have $1,500 in quarters, like, trying to <laughs> bore a hole in the ground. That's heavy shit. Um, and so fast forward 30 years, we're going up to actually go see a NASCAR race uh, up at Watkins Glen, and uh, I got the family in the car, and I drive up past uh, um, uh, Louie's house, the, guy, the Volvo collector, and the 1800s there with a for sale sign again. And I, and I swear to God, I was so excited, I started getting out of the car while it was moving. Like, I'm like, oh my God. And like, they're fainting. I opened the door and Heidi's like, can you stop the car? No, just take us to home and then you can come back. It's not going to go anywhere. I'm like, oh shit, right. So I drive everyone home. I don't even go in to see my parents. I like throw the family out, turn back around, walk up. And I'm like, hey, Louie, are uh, you selling the 1800? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, tell me about what you've done. And he's like, well, I've had it a while. I'm like, I remember the day you bought it. It's burned into my brain. He was like, whoa, that's weird. Because it was four, 14 years ago. And so I'm like, is it, does it run in condition? And, and, and like, I'm like, I said, when was the last time it ran? And I swear to God, he says, what year is it? And I'm like, <laughs> OK, this is going to be an adventure. So. I end up buying the car for, uh, off of him, and it, it's not in drivable condition. So we, but you knew somebody that had a trailer. Yeah, so I knew somebody <laughs> had a, a trailer that would haul dead vehicles around. So we, uh, we go back down to uh, Virginia. We pick up the trailer, uh, his race trailer, and we drive back up. And Yes? I just want you to explain how great a deal we got out of 
Oh, I paid exactly the same amount. For... <laughs> no? How much did I pay for the car? I paid more than he asked. But he paid. He's a family friend. He lives in a home that needed work, I felt. You were like, yeah, Louie, it's cool. Whatever price you give me, it's cool. So we bought the car. Um, and we go to pick it up. And it, it, everything's locked up. We have to use a winch to drag it up onto there and everything. And uh, It didn't have a battery. Well, it had a lot of things. It had two uh, gas pumps uh, <laughs> for... Who knows? Anyway, so, and we end up uh, getting it, uh, we take it up to my house, and my mom asked my dad, well, how was it? And he said, it was like going to a funeral and bringing home the corpse. <laughs> I was like, yikes. Thanks, Dad. But it turns out he was right, because I drug it down to Maryland, I put it up on blocks, and it basically would just, rust would just fall off of it standing still. And it's not even a joke, like literally, like I'd walk out, I'd, I'd have swept and more rust was just sitting there. Uh, I, I dorked around with it for four years and realized it was way beyond my capacity to fix this vehicle. And I, I, get, I found a guy who restores them, and I was like, hey, here's a donor car for parts if you want it. And he rolled up and looked, he looked at me, he looked at my garage and the limited tools I had, he's like, you were never going to make this happen. <laughs> like, I'm like, Woo, okay, thank you for your honest assessment, sir. So, Anyway, to, to not make this about me, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at that. Um, one of the things that you said, and, and actually the, one of the reasons I wanted all of you on stage, um, is I think that cybersecurity um, is this weird union of people who are passionate about this, people whose trade it is, people who are doing academic research, people who are getting paid to do research and do work, and getting them all to play nicely together um, is hard. And I think the three of you have like, kind of a, like a long history of being able to work across those, those kind of boundaries. So I don't know, I mean, what... What's the best strategy? What are your tips and techniques? What thoughts do you have on all these different disciplines playing together in cybersecurity? Well, my first thought is that uh, a lot of the community, and even us when we were um, you know, coming up, I guess, in terms of you know, being drunk on stage. Right. Uh, you know, our first. Or, There's our wine if you want. I'm the only one drinking. There's a whole freaking bottle. <laughs> But okay. a, a, lot of, a lot of what we were thinking about, and, and at least Microsoft was making some inroads at the time, but we were still thinking of industry as adversarial and that they wouldn't listen to us mm -hmm. and that we had to essentially approach them in as brash a manner as we thought was possible. And, uh, and it turns out that now we're all at industry. Like if we think, if we inventory a lot of our good friends that are in the community and are doing good things for customers, we're at the places we wanted to be and that we wanted to influence. And so, A, it allows you to be at one of those places and, and you have the empathy essentially built up of having actually approached this problem from the researcher side, but now you're also engaging with researchers and you know where they're coming from and you know that they actually want to speak to a human. You know that they want you to be responsive within you know, a number of hours, not months, weeks, or not at all. And so uh, you, you drive effectively um, you know, processes that will you know, achieve essentially the goals that you wanted 20 years ago. Yeah. And, um, and, and so that's one, one aspect. And the second aspect is that um, letting people know that there are those people from then that are at the places now allows essentially the community to know that they can reach out and that there is going to be somebody there that's going to be empathetic you know, towards essentially what they're trying to achieve. And I think the other piece in all of this is when people ask about getting into cybersecurity because we think about it as a, it's a newer discipline. And the two pieces to it, it's about building things and problem solving. And it's multidisciplinary, right? So there is, you know, there are technologists, there are engineers, but there are other aspects to this space, sociology, psychology, that in order for us to get to where we need to go, we have to incorporate all those aptitudes and it also brings more people involved. And I think we are now in a day and age where everybody has a responsibility and an accountability for cybersecurity. If you're using a smartphone, you know, the, it's, it's the human behavior piece. And so because we're trying to engage everybody, we have to be reaching out across the industry and beyond to other industries so that people aren't afraid of it. It doesn't feel like this ambiguous or black hole that they're not uh, comfortable getting involved in. Everybody has to be comfortable and familiar with it. And so by bringing in other aptitudes, other skill sets, and people from across, I think we can do a better <coughs> job of making that human behavior piece because you can't outspend human behavior, you can't outspend human error. And so at the end of the day, we've got to get everybody involved. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just kind of say, um, the first is that, you know, 
it, it's really easy for us to, you know, anybody in this to talk about what a horrible mess everything is. Uh, you know, computer security is terrible. Data breaches are weekly events. Everything is, you know, everything's on fire constantly. But on the other hand, you know, uh, things are also better than ever in all sorts of ways. And you know, the the amount of success that uh, cybersecurity, you know, you can say cyber inside the Beltway and not be. Um, um, you know, you're actually saying something here. Uh, the amount of, uh, of progress that this field has made in the last 30 years, you know, that I've that I've been in it is phenomenal, right? I mean, I remember in the 1990s, we had to every conversation you'd have as a security uh, person would start out with you having to spend a long time convincing everyone that security is going to be important someday. Um, and that the internet, you know, will eventually catch on, and that will bring all sorts of threats uh, to it, and vulnerabilities can be exploited, and uh, you know, things that we just take for granted in the background now. Um, the the other uh, the other thing is that if we look at who is successful at actually having impact, um, <clears throat> and fortunately there are lots of those people in our field. It's not so much people who say, I want to do cybersecurity and, you know, in high, start out in high school and then get a college degree in cybersecurity and do uh, InfoSec. It's people who have incredibly broad backgrounds and then stumble into it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, you know, being a generalist is so valuable in this specialty. So um, actually, uh, we have time for one question, and then we're going to have to to wrap it up because uh, then we have to close and get out of here before the hotel charges more money for using their space. Um, but uh, actually, they, we're we're cool. Don't worry. You don't have to run out. Uh, <laughs> um, that actually is a question I wanted to ask uh, you. Um, what's uh, it, we talk, I talked a little bit about this at opening with Heidi. Um, you weren't here because I mean you only showed up for your talk. Um, <laughs> So harsh. <laughs> I, mean, Grr, burn. I, I can give you all the reasons. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, 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 I actually, it was like. I, you didn't tell us you took attendance. I didn't know that. Oh, I, I'm always taking attendance, Matt. There's a tally up here. I know what's going on. Anyway, um, one of the things that we talked about was um, engaging um, uh, people at a younger age and a broader capacity to help build interest, not just aware, I mean, there's this building awareness of cybersecurity as like society, and then there's building interest in it as like a trade and a thing that they might be interested in doing. Um, you know, what's your take on like, what, what are the things that we can do to help engage the next generation to make them more aware, to build a more diverse workforce, to build better cybersecurity capability? So I think when we start using technology in the classrooms, that's the easiest way. It's like, I think the best way to change human behavior is through onboarding. I mean, you're never gonna be more ripe to take on a different culture than when you start a job. Similarly, when we're giving first graders, you know, Chromebooks or um, asking them to use any type of technology to learn how to read, that part of that responsibility of using those devices is the education and the awareness. And so just as kids wanna become teachers, doctors, construction workers, because it's what's in their first degree, if you start teaching them the, that discipline as a means of, I think the, the point about the interdisciplinary, the, the generalist, it, it's all a part of it, but if, they, if it's integrated into what they do, then it is gonna be a part of their interest, it's gonna be a part of what drives them from different angles. It doesn't mean that they're all gonna be engineers, it's sociology, which is why I also think we've gotta do a better job of when we look at position descriptions, really understanding what's required, uh, because it goes beyond just a technology often, and being really clear about the interdisciplinary nature of it. And I could just keep talking because I don't want to, you know, Bruce is talking to Heidi, but I mean, because I have other things that I want to no, say. Good I mean, say it, yeah. Friday night, you know, when, it, I think that looking at this. Um, I, I love I, it when Kirsten goes, it's awesome. I, <laughs> but it's, it's the interdisciplinary nature and it's getting kids to start thinking about it when they're really young. Um, and I think that's, that's a, the big driver for where we are today. Cool, all right. It, we're good. Was, oh, go for it. I was just going to say another another aspect is resources. And um, <clears throat> when we were, you know, when we were exper experimenting when we were younger, um, you know, getting the resources and finding them, you know, required going to, you know, going to essentially uh, yard sales and you know, and dumpster diving and, and and in many cases, you know, just cobbling together all the things you needed to play with the things in order to understand it all. And um, you know, and now the resources are much more easily accessible to you. It's and and. Uh, and, and in the case of you know where I'm working now, um, it's not even just about having essentially AWS credits to go and ex experiment with things, which we offer, or AWS Educate, which is an entire program uh, geared towards colleges and trying to create curriculum that teaches people essentially the platform, um, but also like 
understanding that there are people that need effectively like the resources to go to school. And so even just this year, we announced that we're, we're, we're actually giving out 100, 104 year, $40,000 scholarships a year from Amazon to help people in computer science. Um, and I think, that's, I think those are the types of investments that have to happen from industry to understand that like, you're not going to get people hired if you're not creating essentially the pool to hire from. Yeah. Woohoo! All right, well with that, we're gonna get on with the closing, but first we have some gifts. Um, when you're done, there are some, oh, you, she brought, did you make your best guess of sizing? Excellent, this won't be awkward at all. Like, <laughs> Because what you should really do is, for basically strangers, assume, so you're a 39, 30? Like, you know, it's not going to, not good. Anyway. I'm just going to put them here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you could guess which one she thought was yours. So um, uh, we have cork and towel shirts. Uh, these are very limited edition, so uh, I will show uh, the front is the cork and towel logo, which was the finest fiver that we ever spent. Um, actually, I think noise did. And then the back is actually, in case you forget the instructions, someone can read them <laughs> off your back and you can play. Because it is, it's complicated, right? Um, it's one of those, it's, it, when we go to the board game edition, we'll have to, like, there'll be a book on how to play. This one has a long string attached to it. That's the collector string. <laughs> it does no longer have a string attached to it, so we're good. Also, a bit of a tradition around here. So when, when Beetle got involved with the, the, the Shmoo group, he thought it was kind of, Amusing that most of the first gen Shmoo were all from Alaska, um, and a, and the, <laughs> and we had like a moose infatuation going, and so the first ShmooCon, I think your tagline was less moose than ever, yeah. which made people wonder like, were there more moose before? We're like, well, <laughs> well, we have less now, and that, <laughs> so so these these moose references, they're all lo completely lost. I didn't realize there was some moose connection. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. No. There's absolutely. And uh, the thing is, I'm a. I oh, those are moose. No, they're, yeah, now. correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Now. They're not yeah. elk, and they're uh, not, like, okay. I didn't dress up a cow with antlers. Now, now yeah. I get it. it okay. It's all coming together now. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that, that law degree would be a nice thing to have. <laughs> like, so, tenure. It's tenure. Great. Yeah, yeah, tenure. Yeah, tenure. All right, <laughs> fair. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, we really embrace the moose. I can't draw much, but I can draw moose because I've had to draw moose and create moose in Illustrator and Photoshop. So I know the, like the weird physiology and anatomy of moose. These are three completely different moose heads, and none of them are realistic, but they are going to be yours. So we used to give like a giant moose head to everybody. Uh oh. Why is there crap? I I'm still waiting for my moose tag from like 10 years ago. Oh my God. Oh. Wow, there's a lot of shade being thrown here. <laughs> so you get your second, now smaller moose head. Um, and then Kirsten gets a moose head. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then, oh, it's right, it's the it's a Siamese moose. So here you go, it's a, another right moose on. head. Excellent. So I want to thank our panelists for participating in these shenanigans. We appreciate all your <laughs> feedback. And if you give us about five minutes, we're going to reset and do the closing. So. <laughs>